My name is Michael Fentland, and I uh, kind of got into this like a lot of guys got into Vietnam. Uh, one day I got a call, and they said, we, we want you. And, of course, at that time, jobs were uh, not exactly just falling off trees. And so I got involved with the Fortune 500 company uh, in 1976. In 1977, first place they decided to put me was a little place called Nicaragua. And no one had ever heard of the thing at that time. Um, I flew down there. I was 26 years old, 27 years old. And we were looking at doing a water uh, uh, construction project for the President Samosa at the time. And uh, we were treated like royalty. It was very unusual. Uh, and yet Managua, if you've ever been down in Nicaragua, you'll find it's a very strange city. Uh, it looks like it's been in a war. There's a building, and then there's a couple blocks empty, and then there's another building, and then there's a couple blocks and nothing. And I said to the taxi driver, why can this be this way? He said, well, we had an earthquake in 1972, and you know we just kind of cleared away the rubble, and that's it. And it turned out the real reason to get us down there and, and the company I was representing for about $200 million was that there was some political rumblings going on uh, that we didn't really know about at that time. Uh, uh, ostensibly, the whole deal was they wanted construction, we could be there, we could have a contract, and away we go. Well, for whatever reason, we did not do this project. And within a year and a half, the Sandinistas had taken control of the government. We would have lost all of our equipment. Uh, Reagan came into office and there was a war going on in Central America and I was right there in the front end of it and that's when I began to see the, re the connection between international business and global politics and what this area that nobody had ever known about international law was really all about and what I want to tell you a little bit about tonight is Basically, this is an area that's exploding in the 90s. It's an area that we'll never get away from in the 21st century at all due to several things going on. The global economy and the fact that we're, we're moving more towards UN-type resolutions of intra-country conflict. Uh, but back then, not too many people really knew about it. This has always been the domain of the very large Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies. Until very recently, in the last few years, it's rippled on down to now you have small startup companies who are setting up global operations simply to A, find a, a sufficient number of markets for their products, B, to find investment capital to grow, and uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, Right after Nicaragua in 1979, I was scheduled to, uh, I, I went from Nicaragua to schedule to being involved in Iran. As a contract negotiator on a naval base that was being built for the Shah of Iran in southern Iran. It sounded really, uh, you know, like exciting news. Um, I don't know why, because I always, you know, thought this was exciting to travel, but I got a real knot in my stomach when I heard about this. And, uh, Lo and behold, another company came along, recruited me, uh, and as I'm sitting in the Nile Hilton in Cairo, all of my former cohorts are being put on a barge uh, on the Chabahar Naval Base in southern Iran and being pushed out through the Strait of Oman to one step ahead of the revolutionary forces coming from Ayatollah Khomeini right behind him. Uh, could have been one of the hostages. And, uh, but instead of that, I was getting kicked out of the Nile Hilton. Uh, for some reason, I wasn't really sure of it. They knocked on the door and said, at 5 o'clock, out of here. And I, you know, I, this is second or third country I've been to, and I wasn't really sure what the local customs were. And I thought, well, this is a very strange custom. This has never happened to me anywhere before. And nobody would say uh, what it was all about. Well, it turned out later on, uh, a few days later, it was announced President Carter was coming to Cairo to negotiate the first ever historic peace treaty between Israel and Egypt. And it so happened that the Nile Hilton was the only first class hotel in Cairo in 1979. And if that was first class, baby, I would not want to see second class. 
And they wanted our rooms, and so his couple hundred people in his advance team took over our rooms. And I still want to know who got my room. I know it wasn't President Carter. Um, later on in uh, uh, 82, right after Nixon had opened the commercial doors of China, I found myself there negotiating a first ever uh, technology agreement for pollution control, which they desperately needed since everybody cooked and uh, powered up burning soft coal. And in the wintertime in Beijing, formerly Peking, uh, it becomes a black cloud over the city from all these fires. And I met some young people there, ended up walking on the Great Wall, talking with them about their ideas and future. Uh, the negotiators were almost my age at the time, or a little bit older. Uh, and they were women, which was the first time I'd ever encountered women being in senior negotiating positions in any country I've been in. And it was still one of the rare exceptions from, from most of my negotiations. Uh, <clears throat> but even then, as I uh, talked with a friend of mine on the Great Wall, she said, you know, I'll never get out of this country. You know, it just won't happen. It's too restrictive. Uh, Three years later, I get a phone call from her, and she's at Duke University. I mean, things have really started happening fast, and it's continuing to accelerate. Um, later on, with the oil bust, I became an independent agent, uh, not quite by choice. But uh, in the beginning of 84, I decided this is a great area. There's a lot of international activity. This is an area that will help a lot of medium and small Texas business thrive because everybody needs oil equipment. India was on a billion dollar program to expand their oil industry. Uh, all through Asia, all these other countries that had prospects were going on. So when the, uh, the oil bus kind of wiped out Fortune 500 jobs, I said, okay, let's go out here and get these guys involved. And it was really interesting. Everybody thought I was probably selling real estate from Mars. They said, no, there's no such thing. International business, you're crazy. You know, and I said, look, you know, I've been to India. I've been to these countries. I know what's going on. And they're really looking for American technology. But you guys, and you guys are sitting here going bust in Texas and the Midwest, et cetera, and you're not doing anything. You know, this is a way to, to get going. Uh, you know. So this went on and on and on. Finally, the, the, uh, about 1990 it broke. I think something about Saddam Hussein really changed people's attitudes. I think they finally realized that, and this is a point I've been trying to make for a long time, is that something going on seven, eight, ten thousand miles away from here can have very major impact on our daily lives and will in the future. And unless we're aware of it and involved with it, it can really come up and bite you. As we found out in the 1991, I mean, a half million young Americans, men and women, went off somewhere they had never been before and spent a good part of a year or so in a totally different environment because some bozo on the other side of the planet. And nobody ever gave Saddam Hussein a, a thought until he did his trick. And... Uh, it's funny, because I found an old journal entry talking about him uh, in 1982, I think it was, eight years before he, he did his thing. So, I mean, he had been around for a while. I'd even forgotten about him until 1990. Uh, at the time, I was uh, halfway through writing a manuscript, a fictional book about this flash war in the Middle East that would involve the United States, eventually, because of nuclear terrorism, the new threat of the 90s. Uh, on August 1st, I'm 150 pages into this thing, on August 2nd, Saddam invades Kuwait. It really was strange because I was trying to coordinate what my story was with what was going on, and it was so parallel that I had to stop writing for a while. It was confusing. Uh, you know, international negotiator in the middle of the desert trying to get out. There's a flash war. How do you get out? We had all these hostages over there, oil men from here, and et cetera, and women, trying to get out of this place. It was all locked up. Um, 
the point of, of that and the rest of this is that he has not gone away, but the tools of, of destruction that people like that have uh, are getting greater and greater every day, and the threat is becoming greater and greater every day. Uh, part of what this book, the scenario was, is that a madman like Saddam links up with the cocaine drug lords who have great amounts of money, 100 billion a year in sales, and yet, I mean, worth no morality, no ethical concepts on their part, who do they mutually fear? The United States. Who's messing up their business? Who keeps Iraq from terrorizing the Middle East? Who keeps the cocaine lords from you know, ranting and raving like they want to in South America? The United States. So this little scenario was how they could get together and uh, now that you've got Russia totally disintegrated, you've got all these entrepreneurial guys running around. In fact, there was just a, a live program from Sicily the other night. I don't know if any of you saw it by Geraldo Rivera talking about the international criminal element. Uh, and now you have Russian mafia out selling enriched weapons grade uranium for sale. Uh, you've got the Japanese Yakuza, you've got our mafia, you've got all these other groups. They're starting to work in that work together to do whatever it is they want to do. And my little plot had, you know, a disgruntled Russian general selling a nuclear cruise missile, very small thing. You could take the head off, put it in the trunk of a car, and we're going to use this where? We're going to fire this at Washington, D.C. We're going to wipe out the entire United States government and then you can do what you want to do, because who's going to stop you? Now, this was all supposed to be fiction, but it's becoming less fiction and more possible, which is really the scary thing about it. So as lawyers, okay, and most lawyers are now walking around thinking, I never have anything to do with Iraq, Iran, any of these areas, give me a break. Well, one day they could be sitting in D.C. negotiating a deal and suddenly this mushroom cloud could set up, you know, right on the next block and it would make for a very bad day, you know. Um, so whether or not we want the world to affect us, it is going to affect us. And part of what we've got to become is much more globally integrated with it. And this is happening on two levels. One is the private sector. The other is the public sector, the public sector being the negotiating of the complex Bosnia, Somalia. I mean, how do you, do you now have a war, war crime tribunal against the, the Bosnian Serbs who, and, and the others? Uh, what about Saddam and the future Saddams? Um, but the thing that will probably affect you even greater than that is the other thing that's called the global economy. And, you know, what is the global economy? It's, it's an onrushing, huge machine that's getting larger and larger and larger. And, and it's a combination of things that's forcing this. Um, it's now such that you have a mixing of technology, capital, and markets worldwide. It used to be that we didn't really need a whole lot of other people. We were self-contained small domestic, you know, domestic country, very happy in our own ways. A lot of other folks kind of doing the same thing. Uh, it's no longer possible to do that. We spun off the 1980 as the largest creditor nation in the world. Eight years later, Ronnie hands the keys to George, and we're the number one debtor nation in the world. Four trillion dollars in debt. Uh, we could no longer get the capital we needed to do our own new plan expansion, new business opportunities, anything that we really needed. So where did it come from? Where did our stock market boom in the 80s come from? Half of the money that was being put on Wall Street was coming from Japan, where the average household has over $50,000 in savings. A lot of money just sitting there, and they were all being talked into pumping it into the stock market by their brokers who were shipping it to Wall Street, who were floating junk bond deals on, you know, Milken's latest thing. And finally, by the end of the 80s, that 
kind of house collapse because a lot of it was built on speculation, leverage buyout, and a lot of phony things rather than building real plants, real equipment, all of that. But that's kind of one thing. You shove it aside and now you see that GM in 1982 raised something like two billion dollars uh, for their continued expansion and they're trying to stay alive. And for the first time, they had a global equity uh, financing. Half of the money that GM got was raised in the United States. About the other 40% of it came from three different places. England, the rest of continental Europe, and the Far East. And to show you how those numbers are changing in um, the first half of 1982, almost $15 billion was raised on the international equity market. Uh, that was up from $8 billion of all of 1980, 1990, rather. So you see it's doubled in almost like less than a year and a half. It's going to continue because uh, there's tremendous amounts of money in the world. It's all circulating. You've got petrodollars in Saudi. You've got Hong Kong traders who are, have been known to fly into Las Vegas and have a very nice night of gambling, drop a million dollars, and go home happily back to Hong Kong. No big deal. Just, you know, so what? You know, there's a, uh, a tendency, I think, sometimes for people to think, ah, there's no money out there. But there is. There's vast amounts. And that is what's financing everything that's going on today. You're going to see more of these international deals put together for any type of corporate entity. About two years ago, maybe three years ago, I helped put together a, a young biomedical company with an investor guy. And as a result of that union, they raised about a half a million dollars, him personally. They took that, they went off to Europe, they got a company in France to go ahead and punch in another million or two on part of a deal there, split out the European market. That money gave them the capital then to turn around and fiddle around here for a while and get on Wall Street and, and they did about a four or five million dollar offering about a year or two years ago. So it all became possible by the stair step of international capital and it's going to continue uh, to accelerate. Um, and another reason for uh, our involvement, um, and let me use uh, the Russian example, you know, right now Russia has gone through a tremendous, horrible change. They're going through what we went through in the 80s. Here in Texas, you know how horrible that was. Nobody ever wants to go through it again. Now California, New York, they're all getting a taste of it in the early 90s. They don't like it any more than we did, okay? Now the Russians are over there, and, and think about this in, in terms of, gosh, you're an American, you've, you've got a government system where you're guaranteed lifetime employment, you've got your little DACA, you've got uh, uh, a job, you can buy food, it's all subsidized, you don't worry about it, okay? You could even afford to, you know, do the burial things. Suddenly this great idea comes along called democracy, which means you've got no guaranteed job, costs are going out through the roof. Uh, you're a middle class, middle aged kind of guy or woman. You go, <gasps> what the hell am I going to do? You know, That's what's going on in Russia right now. In fact, I just read a story about uh, the fact that common Russians are no longer able to afford a burial service for their deceased relatives. Their costs have gone up so much. They're cremating people uh, because it's cheaper. Uh, it costs like three months salary now just to try to do a funeral in Russia. You know, and it may not sound like a tremendous deal, but when you start thinking about the average person comparing to what their only standard has been for 70 years, democracy and capitalism doesn't look so great. Yeah, there's a few guys getting real rich because they've figured it out and they're, they're young, they're hustling, you're going to see a lot of young people doing all right. The older people, which is the vast majority, are not doing all right. And that's where your powder keg comes in. It could very much turn back to the old Stalinism, which means our lives change again. Instead of being happy-go-lucky, we're just doing the latest oil deal in Siberia, we're looking at a bunch more missiles crammed down our throats, 
what happens tomorrow. Okay? And if you like doing domestic relations practice, I mean, you know, again, you may look out the courthouse window and there might be a mushroom cloud and you're going to have another bad day. Um, so I feel as lawyers, as international lawyers, we can help make this part of a growth process by putting more investment into Russia, for example, helps us and them. A, we got all this oil technology that's useless over here. They've never punched a hole in Romania below 10,000 feet. They've never had the technology to go below 10,000 feet. We can do that blindfolded, looking backwards. Uh, but we don't have the oil anymore. You know, we punched all the holes like Swiss cheese in the ground. There's nothing left. What are you going to do? You're going to have to go somewhere else and look for it. So it's a combination of these partnerships. They get energy. They get some investment. They get some jobs. We get, you know, split the profits. Maybe we all run to the bank and everybody's happier. Um, they get another McDonald's in Moscow, and maybe somebody can get, you know, a burial policy and afford to earn a buck, and you kind of grow from there. Um, another thing, an example of the uh, internationalization of laws is that uh, Europe has just kicked in with a new combined integrated economic community, whatever that is. What that really is, I think they should call this another lawyer's uh, retirement uh, relief act for Europe and the United States because not only did they kind of unify, they've done a trick or two. Uh, they're passing like 10,000 new rules on standardization of products from toys to artificial hearts. If you manufacture an artificial heart or a toy or whatever, you're going to have to pass the test to get it sold to Europe. So what they've done is they've made it harder for the little guy to export. Nobody's saying trade barrier, but really it is in a way. I mean, God, give me a break. You know, it's another way of saying the same thing. Uh, there was a gentleman who makes uh, these elaborate train sets that are used by hobbyists. Uh, well, the Germans looked at that and they said, this is for toys for kids. He said, a kid's going to run this. This is expensive. He said, no, it's for kids. It has lead in it. You can't sell it the way it is. So either you change or if you're a big company, you get out there and try to change the rules. And all that tug of war is going on. And so you've got lawyers from here, there, everywhere now trying to make rules for Europe. Um, on a closer front, down south of the border, we have NAFTA, uh, which has really made a tremendous difference. Uh, suddenly, the last or so, you know, the uh, year or so, the uh, people I know in the trade business said, you know, we used to never get sales from Mexico. Now, suddenly, they're buying everything. They're going crazy. Um, but. And it's to our advantage. You, everybody thinks, well, you know, how can we win with Mexico? You know, cheap labor, uh, you know, poor country. Well, not so poor and not so, not so cheap. And they don't. See, Mexico, the illusion of Mexico is everything is cheap. Well, if you ever spend much time, you realize they pay high prices for everything because it's been a monopoly. The few families at the top, one of them controlled, you know, making all the soap powders and all that. Somebody else makes all the automobiles and all that. Somebody else has got another area. And so by keeping an oligarchy, you know, very few people in command, prices have been very high. You go into a hardware store and buy, try to buy a hammer in Mexico, whew, you know, that's why they only own a hammer and a pair of pliers. Uh, you put in a Walmart or an Office Depot, they would blow them away, totally. And what is happening now is these companies are starting to, the little lights are coming on, and these are big American companies that haven't yet done too much of this, but they're realizing there's a lot of money to be made down there, so they're starting to set up. You've got Fuddrucker selling hamburgers down there, making a fortune. You've got... Uh, the sporting goods going in down there, and that's a dual benefit because they can also manufacture dirt cheap. So you, you know, it's hard to get somebody here to do that for less than $14 an hour making basketballs. That doesn't make a lot of sense when you get somebody down there to make it for $2 an hour. And uh, it's a low-tech, no-big-deal type of commodity. It's not like you're building a rocket ship. Um, so, th and the Japanese, okay, the Japanese have been the masters of this for a long time, and the Europeans. 
We are the children in this game. And we're blowing our superpower status by playing a solitary game. Uh, just as an example, you're a business, you're in Texas, that's your market, that's where you've already sold, that's it. Okay? Your competitor, Joe, he sells Texas, but he said, oh, God, this is kind of a small market. He's in 49 other states. Who's going to be the big guy? Who's going to win? Okay? Imagine now on a world scale, here we are happily doing the U.S. thing, U.S. of A. And Japan is saying global market, 165 markets. There's the U.S. market, a big chunk, yeah, not the only market. Because you've got the European markets, 350 million people. That blows us away. You've got India with 880 million people, and everybody says, oh, well, they're dirt poor. They don't have anything. They have 250 million, m m million people in the middle class. In the middle class. That equals our entire population, just their middle class. They drive on the left side of the road, Lee Iacocca. You're going to have to put the steering wheel on the other side, but they're buying Japanese cars. They're building Japanese cars over there. I saw the factories. They're building a lot of other things over there. That's the market. By penetrating 165 countries around the world, the Japanese trading companies acquire the enormous financial power and muscle that comes with that. That's why they were buying our Wall Street you know, real estate at premium prices in the 80s. They could afford to. Yeah, they're in temporary slump, but let me tell you, they're in a slump with new equipment, new plants. We're in a slump. We've got old equipment, old plants. You know, when things fire up again, they're going to be at an advantage. Same with the Germans and the other Europeans doing the same thing. It's a global competitive game. The uh, international lawyers here working with our industries are going to either help make us or they're going to help break us. Uh, give you a little example of some things. Uh, uh, years ago, we used to, uh, the major companies would just simply license away the technology. Oh, uh, Japan, you know. Who cares? We'll never sell anything there. Just do a license. Uh, well, they found out after the Middle East uh, would place an order for, and these, some of this equipment stuff I was working on, one pump would be a million dollar piece of equipment. Okay. And we had an LA plant, made these things for a million years. Um, licensed the same technology to a Japanese plant to do the same type of thing. Okay. Good luck, guys. Order comes from the Middle East. They're building a brand new, huge facility. They kind of look around. They say, "We'll buy the Japanese one." And our people go nuts. Why? Why? Uh, because when it came down to testing the equipment and the end, you know, the impeller, the little thing that spins around, uh, it vibrate. What do our guys do? Pull it out. Take a hand file. Ooh, high tech. Do, 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 You know, stick it back in there and see if it works. Uh, okay, try it again. Shh. You know, back. Japan, they put that thing in. First time, move. 60% less cost also. You know, if they're going to buy a million-dollar pump, they're going to buy the million-dollar pump from us, or are they going to go to Japan and get a nicer-made one with our technology for 600000 you know, that's an easy choice. So then the, the deal is, let's scramble around, let's get rid of this licensing, this is bad, and we don't like them doing the business, but we still want the business. So they finally, we got to do a joint venture. Hey, get half the bottom line that way, instead of 5% royalty. Poof, you know, the light bulb comes on, everybody starts waking up and says, that's what we're going to do. It's like a marriage, though. It's a lot more complex to run, because you've got to pay attention to it. And everybody has not really wanted to do that, uh, they, you know, for whatever reason. Now they are, now it's growing, and it's going to continue to do so. Um, but what's the, the short-term outlook for this? Um, I'd like to kind of put a sign up here. Uh, you know, during the, the last election was, it's the economy, dummy. Well, it's the world economy, dummy, that... You know, we fix our tire here in the United States. Heaven 
to help the president. You know, he needs all the help he can get. I mean, we had a Rolls Royce. Now we got a junk Rolls Royce, and we got to try to put it back to where we had it before, and everybody wants it done tomorrow. It takes time to rebuild something when you got four trillion dollars worth of debt that you did not have before. You just can't say, oh, go away. Okay. We fix our tire and try to move on down the road, we ain't going to get very far because you got Europe in the dumps, you've got Japan in the dumps. It's like the other three tires are going to be flat. Unless we get them all pumped up, it's not going to go anywhere. Europe uh, is expected to lose another eight million jobs this year. How does that affect us? It affects us a lot because I was just there last late July in London and Paris finding out how really expensive it still is. I could spend a week in Mexico for what one day in London, Paris was costing. We met with the, the managing director of this huge uh, record company in London, uh, manages Phil Collins. I don't know if any of you know Phil, but he said, God, this is not a recession. He said, it's a depression. You know, and I'm walking down the street in the Chelsea area near Harrods department store, very as West End as you can get, a guy comes walking up to me in a suit and panhandles me for money. I'm wearing a suit. He's better dressed than I am. Like, God, you're really desperate over here. I mean, you, you panic early. You should see what it's been like in Texas. Um, they had a guy out washing windows uh, for cars and taxis on the street corner. Just like you see here, I never saw that. In 15 years going through London, I've never seen that before. In fact, I didn't even see it here until the 80s came along. And it, it was funny because here have been India and China and Panama and all these other areas, uh, about 50 countries the last 17 years, but I never saw anything like that here until the 80s, where I'd step over people trying to go down for a meal in, in Bombay, India, which is a real hellhole. Uh, but that's where the action is. That's the commercial center of India. Uh, and in the 80s, I started stepping over people here. In fact, in the 80s, I was almost one of those people at one time because it was so bad. Uh, if I'd gone into litigation, I'd probably been a lot smarter back then. Um, later on, I did. But uh, at that time, I was a purist. Oh, it's international. Let's save Texas. Let's get this stuff going. And psh, nobody had any money. Um, and the rest of the country was rock and roll and making defense parts. You know, we spent our inheritance making things we could not really sell without blowing someone up, and our Japanese friends were making VCRs that everybody could buy and use and nothing would happen. Um, so now we've come also to this other point of view where what are we going to do with the world as it is because uh, Saddam Hussein, has not gone away. We had a war. We lost a few you know, good people over there. We spent a year, we spent trillions of dollars, billions of dollars. Um, we could have a Gulf War too. You know? Saddam is crazy enough to test President Clinton. Let's go do something else crazy. And he could. Or if he was smart, he'd hang back, get his nuclear weapon or whatever. Um, right now, the Chinese, for example, um, billion people. It's still a Maoist country. They have not reformed politically. Russia has. China has not. Now maybe in the year 2000 they will become a democracy, but they could also be the USSR. They are currently selling M11 and M9 missiles into the Middle East for Syria, Pakistan, these areas. The M11 will carry a nuclear warhead. The Chinese, the Chinese, 5,000 year history, dirt poor, uh, run down country 10, 12 years ago, coming on so strong. They've got capability of launching missiles and commercial satellites into space. Okay, and they've already done it for a couple American companies. Uh, we haven't even given the business to our own American companies. I can't believe it. But uh, Japan. The most powerful economic entity in half or three-fourths of the world can't launch a satellite into space. They do not have the know-how. You know, and right next door to them is this huge country called China that can do it. The question is, what are they going to be launching? 
Uh, the trend is getting scary because it's going to pull us in more and more. The world is shrinking. The need for international counsel is going to grow even on the public side because what do you do with the next Bosnia? Do you just let people keep shooting back and forth artillery shells until everybody's killed? Or do you divvy up the place? Do you have a war crimes tribunal and throw some of these characters into the can and have some leadership? Or what do you do? And I think President Clinton, I think President Bush was kind of getting there, but Clinton has the ball at this time, and it's an opportunity to have a greater uh, UN type of let's cut the BS out there, folks. I mean, come on, give me a break. We don't need to have another ethnic war. I mean, it'd be like Protestants and Catholics here, just like, God, you're a Catholic, I'll shoot you. And, I mean, it's that stupid that it's going on. And the reason it goes on is because nobody stops it. In fact, they, you know, right now along the Danube, floating into Bosnia, military weapons, fuel, you know, all kinds of things, it's not getting to the innocent civilians. And, and this is the uh, thing that I don't think we as Americans can really live with. Uh, who's the champion of democracy out here? Uh, we have all these African conflicts still going on. There's a, they're burning a rubber plantation right now as we speak, a uh, Firestone's plant. Liberia, in Western Africa, nobody's worried about Liberia, are they? You know, all those just poor Africans being shot, mutilated, and killed. You know, that should not be happening either. Uh, while we're so busy focusing on our economy and worrying about our economy, half the world out here could blow up because Russia, Yeltsin could be out tomorrow. Uh, China can do what they want to by the year 2000. They've got a long-term plan. I mean, they're, they're not planning on doing anything today. They've been around 5,000 years. Uh, their, their plan is real genius. Buy everything we can, sell as much as we can back, buy only the high technology, sell them more than you buy, which we're running a huge surplus, and keep talking friendship and being nice, you know. And I really, you know, the Chinese people are really great people. The leadership I wouldn't trust it like a smiling cobra because these are old Mao kind of guys. They were on that long march, and I mean, they're still on that long march. They still hate democracy and everything we stand for. They showed it by killing all these students in 1989. What do we do? We reward them. We actually gave them more trade after they killed these students than what they had before. Nobody seriously questioned most favored nation status. You know, what's going on here, guys? And in, in a way, I, I know what's going on because I was there. I know what the little deal is, and everybody says there's what we have everywhere. We'd be running a huge surplus, and we'd be offsetting. We'd be selling more than we're buying, finally, because we're going to continue sucking in this petroleum, which amounts to about half of our trade deficit anyway. But... If you took the 90% of these guys, and I'm meeting a lot of them every day, and they're just now doing their first deals, you know, and it's, it's like Cowboy City all over again. Oh, it's, we got a deal in Australia. We're going to go to Australia. Um, gee, great. You know, you want a contract? All right. I, you know, I went through this last um, summer. I said, uh, have you met your partner yet? No. Have you been to Australia yet? No. Uh, this is a $50 million company. You know, God, you can afford a ticket. Go on. You know, before you start getting married to these guys, go over and take a look and check out the market, and then we can cut your deal. And they said, great. And then they went off, got another lawyer <laughs> draft after the contract who had no idea what Australia was all about. But, you know, at least I gave them the right direction to start off with. And so I see this now where you have other companies. They're starting, there's another uh, uh, metal building company. You know, pretty, I mean, that doesn't sound like a rocket, does it? Metal building, so what? Who would need those? hundred and some odd uh, developing countries in the world. They've got a deal set up in Poland now. In Poland. And they're going gangbusters. They think, gosh, you know, this is really cool. You know, they got a guy who doesn't speak Polish running the thing, but, you know, simple problems like that. This is where the international lawyer comes in and says, gosh, guys, you're going to do this. You're going to have to do certain things. Um, of course, the Fortune 500 was not any better. 
if I recall distinctly, uh, we'd have a train manager in, in London running the Middle East and the African operations. When he really got knowing what he did, what, what the management would do is they'd pull him out, stick him off somewhere in Alabama, take some guy out of swamps of Louisiana and stick him in London and say, you're in charge. And he'd go, okay. And it started all over again. And, you know, they carry certain attitudes and, you know, don't have any idea of the customs and the way of doing business. And, you know, you lose a lot of ground just starting over again. There needs to be more of a consistent training program. Right now for lawyers in Texas, you cannot get certified as an international lawyer. I've been arguing about this since the mid-80s, saying, hey, we really should be certified right now. In the 80s, nobody ever talked about international. I was the only one. I set up my practice, and I was kind of lone, you know, voice in the woods. Well, now I'm getting flyers from other lawyers, and guess what? One of the first things they list under specialties, international business. I, I, you know, the first thing I want to ask them is, where have you done deals? You know, have you actually been there? What do you know? And, and, and it's not a comparison thing because really I think we ought to have a training program because this is such a diverse, unique area. I speak English, okay? I took three years of Chinese. I would never swear I was fluent in Chinese. I speak poquito espanol. Um, but, and English is the universal commercial language, really. In 50 some odd countries, I've never really had any trouble communicating. Sometimes you wave your arms, but it's never been a problem. In India, 880 million people, English happens to be the one unifying language they have out of 14 different languages and the thousands of dialects. They can communicate with each other because of the British inheritance of the English language. Um, but yet, the most fundamental common thing of negotiating with these people, oh, Americans can really make some blunders. I mean, we're used to the five-minute deal here, baby. You know, the one-minute manager, you know, the five-minute deal can make last five minutes, but you can do it in five minutes. I have yet to be in a country that does anything in five minutes. I mean, out there, it's let's get to know you, let's have dinner, let's meet again, let's talk some more, and let's get, you know, your family and all. You may not even want to talk about the deal until way into this thing. But yet, you know, our guys are over there putting their feet up, showing their souls to the Saudis, which is horrible, uh, trying to rush them, getting anxious, thinking, my God, you're messing around with me. You don't look me in the eye. I don't like that, you know, uh, and making a fool of themselves. And some, a lot of these guys represent very large companies. And I saw an executive one time for our, our large company, went to Middle East looking for business, really needed the business. This is back in the 80s. Um, showed up, and I think it was in Saudi, uh, must have done something really well because the sheikh said, why don't you stay for dinner? You know what the guy said? Uh, we got to be in Kuwait tonight. We got an 8 o'clock flight. Uh, we're, you know, got to stay in schedule. Sorry, Sheikh. Bye. And he did. He left. He made his other meeting. Never did understand why I didn't get any business. You know, in the Middle East, it's actually honorable, and it adds more to your importance, to show up late, like a day or two or maybe two weeks. You're very powerful. God, you weren't here on time. You know, you don't get brownie points for being on time. Um, but if you don't know, and if the lawyers don't know to train them, what can you do? So it's both a business and it's a legal thing because the lawyer, I was always out there with a technical guy. Okay? So you have the law side and the technical side. And that's it. And go into X number of countries and sit down and start working on a deal. Um, none of us have had much experience in these areas, and that is why the, there's a major defici deficiency. The Europeans are used to it. They've been out there. They've always had to kind of look outbound. The Japanese have had to. They don't like it, but they do it. Uh, we, a lot of people here, don't necessarily like it because it's, it's not the same old routine. It's something new and something different. Um, 
I always got butterflies. Every time I used to go into Panama, you know, what am I going to expect? I was in Pakistan right before a major riot, and they burned our embassy. You know, people were nice. In fact, one of my coworkers was there the day they burned the embassy. He was in the crowd. They looked at him and said, you American? Yes, yeah, yeah, sir. Okay, no big deal. We're just burning your embassy, man. Yeah, your government stinks, but, you know, you guys are okay. We like you Americans. They really do. They, I've always gotten treated better in these countries than here a lot of times. I mean, you're a guest. You're treated with honor. You know, maybe in Egypt they drive at night with no lights. Same in India. Crazy. I mean, you think you're going to get killed. But you always get treated with respect. Uh, if we'd ever run into one of those sacred cows, though, I don't know how nice they would have been. I've probably, I've been history on down the road. Um, so it is continuing to accelerate, and it will continue to accelerate. What you are seeing now with this small gathering is just the beginning, because it's blowing up. Uh, in most countries of the world, they do not solve disputes by litigation. They solve them by negotiation or you work out a problem. Litigation is an American phenomenon. Now, I've been involved even in international litigation here through the judicious use of our long arm statute. And it is, baby, it's a long arm. Um, I always kind of wonder, you know, even when they come in and argue about the jurisdictional side of it, still end up collecting some money out of it. So. But it's because of the international business connections. Now you have all these European companies, they're doing deals over here via letters of credit. We had a deal with the Bank of Oman. I probably shouldn't mention the name. Um, they ended up having to cut a deal in American court. But it's tricky with the jurisdictional things. And this can become more of a problem. Yeah, we have an International Sales Code Act. <clears throat> you know, so what? It, it gets down to who can you sue and how can you get a hold of them and bring them on into our court. Now if we were now if the Europeans were doing this, we'd be mad as hell. Because I mean suddenly you get a a petition from some place in Swaziland or, you know, Switzerland and you're gonna have to go over there and hey, our rates are cheap. You know, three hundred dollars an hour, that's half of what the Germans are charging for legal services. And even the you know, in Mexico, it's pretty substantial. Uh, but as Companies shift back and forth. You start wondering, where is jurisdiction? Who's got to side us? Where is it all going to end? It's going to be thrown into courts. We're going to have lots of litigation. You won't have to worry about it. And if you can speak another language at the same time, everybody will consider you to be totally absolute, the expert, no matter if you don't know anything, and you'll do great. Um, so I always thought maybe I should have gone off and spent a semester at Oxford or something. And they said, oh, you're really, you know. And then I can run for president, right? Yeah. All right. At this point, I want to uh, turn it over for questions, and uh, we'll do whatever Q and A you'd like. Uh, what do you think we're going to have in the way of changes or impact in the Clinton administration on the international business scene? Uh, it's early days. Um, that's a very good question. Um, don't know. I don't know. See, no, this is different because we have a president. Um, who's not been a global kind of guy, but he's a global thinker. Um, and I think he's going to go by what his advisors come up with. He's got a very good instinct. I've noticed, like, like on NAFTA, he said, okay, NAFTA's cool, we're going to let it stay, but we really need some environmental and some adjustments here. You know, and you think, well, uh, especially when grandmother was sick and uh, in uh, Tucson, we drive out there because I've always flown. I wanted to see the United States on the ground for change. We're driving along fine. Took Laura with me, you know, faithful assistant. Finally needed a break. We get to El Paso. Suddenly, she cannot breathe. She has, you know, had asthma as a child. Could not breathe. And this green stuff was floating up this valley from the south side of the river. It was all the pollution from the Mexican plants coming up the mountain range between El Paso all the way up to Las Cruces. Man, they had to roll out the windows, gas it, and just head on down the road. She almost had cardiac arrest. It, it's something, and then the latest story, uh, I don't know if you heard about it, in Brownsville, where there's a lot of babies 
unbelievable, large, unusual number of babies being born without brains on our side, okay? And everybody, the mayor's kind of saying, uh, we don't know where that's from. You know, an idiot can put this, no, we're going to do a study, okay? You know, I don't, somebody's going to get a lot of money to do a study. Um, I wouldn't charge them five cents. It's, it's the water, dummy. You know, you dump all these toxic chemicals in the wa Rio Grande. That's the drinking water for Brownsville. These poor people are drinking it. It's going to end up causing birth defects. That's what's happening. Uh, Brownsville can't solve it by themselves. Our governor cannot solve it because it's an international problem. Who's going to solve it? It's got to be done on a national level. It's going to have to be some kind of implication of a Mexican Environmental Control Act for all these plants that are dumping God knows what because they're dealing with uh, computer chip manufacturing, all these things where you use cyanide and arsenic and all these wonderful sounding heavy, nasty metals. What do you do with it? Oh, jump it in the water. Don't think about it, you know? And then somebody else is drinking the water, not thinking about it. It's kind of funny color water today. But this is where I'm, you know, in the international thing, in Texas, everybody thinks international. I think of Mexico. Well, that's only one place in the, in the world. But it does happen to be a good place to think about right now because it's about the only country booming in the world. Um, the other place, Paris, I mean, we went to Euro Disney uh, to put the pitch on for a Texas company. You know, they got a cowboy theme. They better have some real, authentic Texas videotapes, you know, produced in Texas to make them real. Good idea, right? So we kind of saunter over there, take this guy with me, uh, who's the owner. He was part American Indian, okay, and they're just terribly in love with American Indians. Well, good. We'll introduce him to this guy, and it should be instant love. Well, they're having a recession. Um, not only that, but we're sitting in London. You know, we've just heard the sad story from the managing director in London, getting ready to dive into France. The bloody French truck drivers shut down the entire country, called their little blockade, because they're mad over the licensing regulations by the French government. Hey, you got five points on your deal. When you lose your five points, you're grounded out. They say, no, no, we shouldn't be treated like you average American, you know, tourists, you know, motorists. We want extra points, so to prove our point, we're going to shut down this whole place. They did. They did. I met people afterwards that tourists, Americans from Ohio, et cetera, they spent the whole week crisscrossing France in tour buses, taking back roads, thinking they're going to run around it, and poof, they'd run into another roadblock. And this... Uh, um, other guy, I forget if he was, no, he's British. It was wild. He was British, living in, with, in a farm in Grenoble, France, and had Czechoslovakian truck drivers backing over his little precious little trees in his farmyard to turn their rigs around to go back another way because they were frustrated by the blockade, and he was ready to get out there with a shotgun and blow them all away. And, in fact, his wife was glad that he had left his shotgun somewhere else. She was afraid he was going to use it. I mean, that was an international conflict right there. Um, we managed to get through. We took the uh, Sunday train in because they were blocking trains. Uh, figured they wouldn't block anything on Sunday. They everybody chill out. And then took a night train coming back after our meeting and uh, managed to get in and out, had our meeting, and they'll probably fire up something this year on it. But they've been slow because first time Disney's ever had a European operation. Uh, turns out they don't even know where all their clients are coming from. Not only 20% from France, about 20% from the UK. Uh, a bunch more from Northern uh, Europe. And guess what? Uh, some of them use the PAL format for VCR, some use CCAM, of course the British and the, Fran and the French, opposite kinds. And ours is NTSC, so we have to get them converted. So they're trying to figure out, you know, do I need the PAL, do I need CCAM, you know, it's a mess. So. These are the types of things that are going on, uh, and we'll continue to. Now they're standardizing. They'll they all have some kind of standard on that eventually. But uh, it's an export product for a good Texas company. The next thing is Japanese. They're all nuts about country dancing over there. You know the big rage? They're nuts about Americans. Uh, the only problem is most Americans don't know that they're nuts about it. Americana, nostalgia, anything that's got an old 
uh, sign, you can sell for a lot of money over there. It takes a long time to break in because like Europe, like South America, like the Middle East, you've got to become friends with them. You may spend a year or two years finally getting to a point where it's cool. But even once you do, if somebody else comes in with a 10% better deal or whatever, will not make an impression. You know, I like my friend because he's always treated me right. And uh, it's a long-term deal that could last for decades. And that's the type of thing. This is, and the bottom line of the thing that I want to get across, okay, we've got developing countries building entire new infrastructures, roads, bridges, factories, all kinds of things. Are they American standards? Or are they European or Japanese standards? And not that it's bad that they're European and Japanese, but what about the next generation? Are they going to be looking at it as an American thing or somebody else? You know, if we're not involved with them, the Russians, somebody else will, and they have been. And I feel if we're really going to be world leaders, we better, by golly, be out there being world leaders. And that means helping them, being involved with them, showing them what democracy really is all about by being there instead of just saying, well, we're wonderful, and sitting home and munching some popcorn in front of the TV set. You've really got to, you know, Russia made a lot of uh, points. They didn't have money back when they were the bad guys, the USSR. They put people out there, and they were turning villages in, from dark, nasty villages. They were putting electric generators in, get them light. Wow, these guys are neat. Simple things. We haven't done that. Um, this is what we need to do all the way around the world to really be Americans, showing what democracy and free enterprise is all about. We ought to pile in the airplane and all go to Russia right now and try to get those guys cooking because if they go back to the bad old ways, it's going to really mess everybody up. They've got 30,000 nukes sitting around that have not been disassembled. And uh, uh, it's just that close, that close from happening. And it's whether it's something or don't do something that does make the difference. And you guys, you guys will be the point on this eventually. You don't know it yet because you're still in school, but it's going to come because business can't operate without you, without your expertise from a law standpoint from ground zero, international on top of that. You know, as an advisor, consultant, even beyond that, um, there are very, very little in the way of international business programs, even. But the lawyer is the guy, and the woman, in the Fortune 500. Nobody does anything without talking to the lawyers. And if you don't know, then nobody knows. And, and when, when they send somebody somewhere, if it's Oogie Boogie Land, and the middle of Borneo, to talk to the Sultan of Brunei, who's worth billions, and sitting in his, it's going to be the lawyers. It's going to be your job. So that's the challenge. Good question. Uh, you need a combination of things. You need a good basis in law, yes, uh, but you also need to know about negotiating. You also need to know about how other countries operate, their customs, basically. You know, like a lot of France, Napoleonic Code, you know, a lot of countries, uh, Egypt, etc., they kind of go more by codes. But then you find See, we're the only, probably about the only country where you find everything is just, man, written down to the last period, comma, and reams and reams and reams of it. Not so out there. Um, India, for example. Uh, you know, I once, a lawyer came up to me and said, oh, we know all about India. We've got the books on India. I said, great. Uh, how many deals have you done in India? Hmm. Uh, well, the books will tell you you can only have a five-year license in India. That's what the books say. I can tell you I have negotiated personally with the largest company in India in eight-year license. Eight-year. How you do that? You negotiate. Everything's negotiated out there. I mean, it's all negotiable. 
uh, you can only own 51%. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe you own 100%. Depends on your argument. Uh, so what you find out, it's very fluid. It's very much a negotiating style than saying, geez, the law says you can have five and that's it. In fact, the guys that went in or the women that went in and said five years ended up screwing their client because maybe you don't get to just negotiate with a private party over there. Then you had to go through the government approval process. And those who were arrogant or silly or didn't think about it and thought, well, we'll just blow past these guys and come walking out with what we want. No, they've got jobs. They're going to have to show that they're doing their job. I intentionally left stuff in there that they could take out. Didn't matter. We still got what we wanted. But they could say, hey, we got a year knocked off this deal, or we did, you know, got a percentage knocked off, and we did our job. Great, man, I'll congratulate you, and we'll sign the deal, and out of here we go. That's the way you've got to do You've got to plan ahead. You've got to know what's going on, and it takes a little bit of homework, and you can't just get it from a book. Any other questions? What's the best course of events, would you say, after law school? Unless if you did want to go to the Fortune 500 company, do you look at their, just the regular counsel department? Maybe they have the uh, different ones are doing it different ways, and it's going all over the They can run over anybody. They're excellent. But in another country, they have no stroke. And again, you don't do business that way. I mean, I could take people lunch, but you've got to work the network. You've really got to know how the system operates. Each country is different. Different, totally different. Different customs, different ideas, different pace. And you got to, you know, an international lawyer, it's a bit of a chameleon act in a way because you're either an aggressive SOB on this side of the planet, but on the other planet, in Japan, you don't look at people and you're kind of, you know, you kind of look embarrassed. And Um, it really takes, and I have to say this, guys, I hate to say this, women are going to be better at this than a lot of guys because they're flexible, they don't, they, they kind of do this multi-dimensional stuff. Now, in Saudi, even I've seen women go into Saudi and do deals. That is incredible. And, I mean, the ladies that have done that are some shrewd characters because in Saudi, a woman does not bear her ankles. She does not go unescorted without a husband or a relative. Da 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 da. da. You know? And for a foreigner, foreign woman to come in and to actually be able to get somewhere with these guys is pretty amazing. It happens. Um, it doesn't happen as much as it probably should. You know, still most of it's guys and guys getting, you know, vodka toast until you can't see straight. Chinese do the same thing with Mao Tai. Um, and, but that's part of the process. You're going to see a lot more of that. Um, but to get back to your question, I still don't find too many courses really devoted um, 
to the international uh, scene. It's impossible to really get it into one course. Uh, you'd have to have 50, maybe 100 different courses. You the Far East, booming market, 10% growth rates a year. Asia uh, is Malaysia, Indonesia, Japan, China, South India, that area. They're all terribly unique, very individualistic, and they're growing like mad. But you have to adjust your strategy in each one. They each have a, you know, uh, T. Boone Pickens and some guys like that went to Japan, tried to buy in, uh, had a real rough time. You know why? He was known as a corporate raider. I mean, the hairs on the back of the Japanese head stood up like that. You don't do things like that in Japan. And even though he wasn't there to do that kind of thing, he said, um, they don't, they, you know, they're worried. You know, is he going to do? Going to start selling our stock to some other people, and uh, you know, an Ivan Bosky or a Milken doing deals with Japan just probably would not work, uh, because you become to do stuff there. You want to become as close to them as you can get, and it takes a lot of time. And they're more insular than we are. You know, we think we're, you know, kind of isolationist. Well, Japanese are too, and it's going to. Uh, it was uh, the uh, president of. Is that uh, Mashusta was asked how long he thought it would take the Japanese to become international? If they think they're not international already, and he said a hundred years, and he was serious. And they've got like 250-year business plan. I mean, our guy's got three-month plan. Okay, that's long. They've got a 250-year business plan at Mashusta. I mean. God, I was, I, what am I going to be doing in the year 2250? But that's what they've got. Um, so that's why it takes some adjustment. And I, you know, I really feel we could even be selling more cars in Japan for a couple of reasons. One is you've got to build them better, sure. The other thing is I heard Lee Iacocca make argument or, and some of the other executives that, you know, well, you've got to buy the ones that the steering wheel are on this side, and if you buy enough of them, we'll, we'll move it. To the side that, you know, in Japan, they drive on the left side of the road, guys, just like England and India. You know, they can't uh, steer wheel on that side like ours. Man, you know, you're going to hit somebody. You've got to make the investment, move the steering wheel, and then, Lee, you're probably going to sell some cars, whether, you know, if you really do a good job and get to know your brothers over there. But in the middle of a meeting with the Japanese, he gets up, leaves, doesn't tell anybody what, what he's doing, gets on an airplane, flies back to here, gets in front of a bunch of people, and gives a speech and says, they, they're really, you know, they just don't negotiate in good faith. You know, hey, you know, gosh, you know, maybe that's why you're not selling so many cars. And it's the younger generation, it's going to be the women, and it's going to be our, our group that starts making the changes here. Because the young Japanese, young Chinese, and even the young Russians and the rest of them that I've met are very much like us. They want the same things, even in the Middle East. The second the, those airplanes take off from Riyadh, a lot of the women are in the back getting out of those stupid long things and putting on Western clothes and getting ready. And when they're coming back in, they're back in there, going back in traditional mm, format. Oh, I've got to do this again. You know, and the Kuwaitis here, the women are out there trying to save the bloody country. They do very heroic acts. First thing that happens after we win the war is the Emir puts them all in the back room again. You know, and we don't do anything about it. So it's going to be a powder keg. Eventually it will blow up because... They're mad. They've used weapons. They know how to fight. They don't have any votes. They feel like they're the blacks of, you know, 1992. And women in a lot of countries are really, I mean, they're really in sad shape. Uh, Japan doesn't really, you know, let them into the front room. It's only been fairly recently that they've made headway here. Uh, China was one of the few places where I saw a lot of women at the top. I mean, very, very top. Um, if they would flip into a democratic mode, it'd be tremendous. But I don't know yet. But that's why I'm saying even our president is going to have to really be a global president from here on out. Whether you know anything about it or not, you better. And right now, if you haven't been there, you're going to have to rely on your advisors. And baby, you know, you're going to have to just trust people. 
But it's a big difference from trusting somebody and knowing in your gut exactly what it's like out there and having to deal with people and being able to really make it hum. So we're on the edge of it. You're going to see this uh, expand exponentially in the next few years. We can't get away from the global economy. We're not going to go back living in little boxes, you know, little wood shacks all by ourselves in the backwoods hunting squirrels. You know, never going to happen again. You know, it's going to be eating something, you know, sushi, canned sushi from Japan, and they're buying T-bones from here, and, and that's it. And I think that will be a better world, actually, because once we all get around and mix up a little bit, I think it ought to be a requirement of American citizenship to make people travel a little bit. Because let me tell you, when I came back from India, and places like that, they're really poor, and I just, oh, God, it just rips your heart out. You know, kids coming up to you, and they're missing limbs. They've been mutilated by parents so they can actually increase their livelihood as beggars. And the lawyer in the next office is complaining because they didn't pick the garbage up exactly at 9 o'clock on Wednesday morning. Who cares? At least they pick it up. I've been in places where they haven't even picked it up. You know, I appreciate what you've got. Because a lot of play people just don't have it. And uh, so it, it puts you in a unique position as an international lawyer. You can always do domestic work. That's simple. Do an international, you're going to have to add some layers on top of it. It takes time. I would say even after being 17 years in 50 plus countries, I don't know at all. I wouldn't even you know, begin to say that. Um, but I know a lot more than I did starting off a little farm in Iowa. But, uh, but it's you. You're the next generation of this, okay? And it's people like you that can make a big difference in where this country is, being part of the world. You know, they know about us, but how do we lead if we don't know anything about them? How can you be led by someone who is ignorant about someone? So if we know, then we can do well. Thank you very much. Nothing like my speech.